you are aware of civilizations in world history that no longer exist. What would it have been like to go back in time and to be in, in those civilizations and to observe what happened that ultimately caused those nations to decline and fall? I'll tell you what it would have been like. It would have been like what is going on in the United States right now. Because we are witnessing the dismantling of America's Christian civilization. Let me backtrack and review here just a little bit. I have suggested to you that this country is in the midst of a culture war that far exceeds the significance of any physical or military conflict with which we may be involved. And I am absolutely convinced that the central issue at stake in this culture war is whether or not this country is going to maintain its original orientation toward God, the Bible, and the Christian religion. The indicators are, as a matter of fact, that every effort has been taking place for the last 40 to 50 years, primarily since the turbulent 60s. And these efforts have coalesced over time and consist of every effort being made to expunge public references to God, to Christianity, and to the Bible. I have called your attention in our previous sessions to government documents, utterances by the Founding Fathers, to see what their attitude was, what was their perspective with regard to God and the Bible. And of course, uh, that information is decisive. It is unanimous, virtually, and it is decisive. Now, here are some of the documents that we've examined that unquestionably, explicitly refer to the God of the Bible and in many cases to the Christian religion and Christ in particular. There's so much more evidence that we could, we could spend a lot of time just on that matter. Uh, hours and hours and days. Let's move to a second aspect. What about our money? American currency. Do you know uh, the expression in God we trust has not always been on our money. In fact, it dates back to the Civil War. Do you know what was going on then? Here was our nation at war with itself. And there were those who said, you know, down the, down the road of history, people are going to look back at this period and they're going to think, what was with that group of people? That they would fight with themselves? We need to have some more public manifestations of our religion and our belief system so that history does not misunderstand what was taking place here. Consequently, Salmon Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury under Abraham Lincoln, issued a directive to the Director of Mint in Philadelphia and specifically said, no nation can be strong except in the strength of God or safe except in His defense. The trust of our people in God should be declared on our national coins. And so, he directed that a motto be formulated and that it be placed uh, on American coinage. As a matter of fact, Congress stepped in at that point and in 1864 issued a formal decree authorizing the motto, In God We Trust. It appeared for the first time on the 1864 two-cent coin. Since that time, uh, coins, of course, have represented that motto to this very day, despite the fact that several attempts have been made and continue to be made in an effort to eradicate that religious expression. I got to thinking, though, do you mean that's the first time in American history that there was any indication in our currency about our belief in God? So I began investigating. I went back to the 1700s. I came across these Constellatio Nova Coppers. Constellatio Nova, new constellation. 
There's a new constellation in the universe, was the idea. On these coins, these are just after the Revolutionary War, you will observe some very clear symbols, 13 stars. There's your new constellation representing the original 13 states. Notice that there are rays emanating from the center out to those stars. And in the very center of the coin is an eye. And history is decisive in the meaning of this symbol. It is in fact the eye of God. And his care being radiated out toward the states. And this is very common in this period. Here is a 1779 $40 currency note. And of course it too has the same imagery. The stars, the rays, and the providential eye of God. What are we going to do about this? And as I said, there are sinister forces that are attempting to eradicate and expunge these manifestations. Let's take a look at some of our national symbols. You recognize this one? This was actually cast before the beginning of our nation in 1751 and used in the Philadelphia Assembly Hall. Uh, this uh, great monument has recently received uh, a brand new resting place in Philadelphia. They've constructed a whole new uh, building and it has been placed there just within the last year. You remember that this uh, object was used to uh, ring out liberty for the first time when our nation began and thus it was adopted as one of our national symbols the Liberty Bell and yet here inscribed not inscribed actually um, whenever the the bell was cast it was it was cast into the bell Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 10 proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof I suppose the ACLU will need to descend upon the city of Philadelphia with their hammers and chisels and get uh, this obvious violation of separation of church and state chiseled from this national symbol. Another one of our great national symbols was actually uh, constructed for the purpose basically of uh, commemorating the uh, centennial, the first centennial in uh, 1876. You know the, uh, the woman herself was constructed in France and given as a gift to our nation. The pedestal was built by Americans. If you were to go to the fourth level at the foot of the statue you would find seven jade green glass plaques each with an inscription. Six of those taken from the words of famous American statesmen. The seventh plaque has Leviticus 25, the very passage that is inscribed on the Liberty Bell. Another change then that will need to be forthcoming. Are you aware of the fact that our nation has a seal, a national seal? In fact, on the very day that our founders declared their independence from England, July 4th, on that same day, uh, those who had gathered on that occasion commissioned a committee to formulate a national seal that would express the sentiments of our nation, our value system. The three individuals that were placed on this committee were Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams. They set about the business of trying to create a seal that would embody American ideals. Uh, actually, it took a number of years in order for this uh, seal to be achieved. You can see the imagery that uh, ultimately came about. You can see the 13 stars that represent the stage. You can see E Pluribus Unum, which became one of our mottos, out of many one. Do you know we've been told in the last 40 to 50 years that what that means is out of many different nationalities, many different ideologies, many different religions, we've all come together to be one people. That's one more lie. They meant by that out of many distinct and separate states, one new nation. 
Do you know what Thomas Jefferson and uh, Benjamin Franklin wanted to do with regard to this seal? These two men collaborated and came up with the idea that we need to have on our national seal a picture of Moses crossing the Red Sea with Pharaoh in hot pursuit and this motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Tremendous idea, but they did not get their way. In 1782, the um, Great Seal was finalized. Are you aware of the fact that um, on this side of the seal, we have, of course, the American bald eagle. We have an olive branch indicating the desire for peace, and yet arrows indicating the need to be willing to defend our nation. Are you aware that if you flip this seal over, you have what some call the spiritual side of the seal? Again, the symbolism is somewhat apparent. You have a uh, pyramid with 13 steps, representing the 13 states, with 1776 on the bottom uh, level. You have the uh, providential eye, the eye of God. And notice that you have Latin. And once again, the school system is not what it was 200 years ago. Uh, people were taught some of these classical languages. Anuit coeptus. Do you know what that means? It means he, that is God, favors our undertakings. Are you aware of the fact that this national seal, both sides, are on the one dollar bill? So the ACLU is going to have to do something about that. Two references to God on every dollar bill in this country. On and on we could go. National symbols that demonstrate our biblical and Christian heritage. Let's move to our architecture. If you were to go to our nation's capital and spend days, perhaps weeks, perusing the architecture that has been constructed over the last 200 years, you would be amazed. For example, the United States Supreme Court that has been instrumental in, in helping to foment this gradual dismantling of America's Christian heritage. There are, in fact, multiple references to the Ten Commandments uh, at the Supreme Court. For example, here are the oak doors that separate the courtroom from the central hallway of the Supreme Court. You can see a circular engraving on the lower section of one of those doors. Let me blow it up for you. Pray tell, what is that? Someone says, well, that's the Bill of Rights, First Ten Amendments. Interesting that they're carved on two tablets of stone. If you were to look at the actual bronze gates of the courtroom, same emblem on the support frame. If you were to go outside of the U.S. Supreme Court and go around to the east pediment and look up, you would see a number of sculptures, including uh, three lawgivers. The central one, who is full face and most prominent in the pinnacle, the apex, is, of course, Moses and the Ten Commandments. What are we going to do about these symbols on the highest court building of the land? Moving to the Library of Congress. Here's a phrase from Lord Tennyson in the rotunda of the Library of Congress. One God, one law, one element, and one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. Amen. Here is a painting called Knowledge in the North Hall of the Library of Congress. It has the inscription, Ignorance is the Curse of God. Knowledge the wing wherewith we fly where? To heaven. Then in front of the U.S. District Court building, <laughs> an unmistakable symbol, including once again the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. Then we have in front of the Ronald Reagan building, Liberty of Worship, and yet here she is resting upon 
the Ten Commandments. It's all over the place. Moving to the White House. Here is what's known as the Adams Prayer Mantle because it goes all the way back to John Adams. It says, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it may none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. This goes all the way back to 1800. A prayer mantle. You can't pray in the public school. But there's a prayer mantle in the White House. What a contradiction. You have only two choices. You either remove this symbol or you realize that the removal of prayer from the school was an absolute ridiculous response to cultural change. Moving to the U.S. Capitol. Now we're dealing directly with our representatives and our senators. If you were to go to the House chamber and specifically uh, observe the uh, 23 marble relief portraits that are situated, there are 11 of these 23 that show faces facing in one direction. Uh, each of these uh, faces represent various individuals that have had anything to do with law, representing uh, legal ideas. Eleven additional faces facing the opposite direction. So you have eleven facing to the left, eleven facing to the right, facing each other. The twenty-third is in the center. It is the full face relief of Moses. Also in the U.S. Capitol, if you were to go to the rotunda, look up, you would see a 360 degree panorama, uh, 58 feet above the floor. And these various painted panoramic friezes represent various events of American history. How about the baptism of Pocahontas? Obviously uh, a Calvinistic view of this, probably sprinkling. Nevertheless, the Christian connection, very evident. This was placed in the Capitol in 1840. When I went to the website, this is a government website. Look at the statement that I copied verbatim. This scene symbolizes the belief of Americans at the time that Native Americans should accept Christianity. No one would be so politically incorrect as to think that now. But that's what Americans at the time thought. Another one. Protestant pilgrims came to America, 1620. William Brewster holding the Bible. Preacher John Robinson leading Governor Carver. William Bradford, Miles Standish and their families in prayer. Do you know that Thanksgiving is still observed in the public school system? But do you know what it is? You just need to be thankful. For what you have. That's not what Thanksgiving has been historically in our nation. It has been an observance directed to God. Thankful to God, the pilgrims themselves were oriented thoroughly and fully in that direction. This was placed there in 1844. The Great Experiment Hall, also in the U.S. Capitol, chronicles uh, various legislative milestones over 300, century, 300 years of uh, American activity all the way up to 1920 and women's suffragette. 32 different vignettes. Here are three of those murals. George Washington taking the oath of office as the nation's first president, 1789. And yet what is it that he has his hand on as he takes the oath of office? No question as to what that alludes to. Here's Abraham Lincoln who had just taken the oath of office. Salmon Chase who had just administered the oath of office standing to Lincoln's left. What is it that uh, the Chief Justice is holding that was used in order to administer the oath of office? Another one of these murals, 1789, the first federal congress. On the left, a preacher. On the right, a printing press. Freedom of religion. What religion? and freedom of the press. All of these symbols are very true to history. Did you know that uh, the U.S. Capitol has a chapel? 
So far as I know, it has not yet been sanitized like the rest of our culture is being adjusted. But here is a stained glass window that has George Washington on his knee praying. Notice the passage from Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Notice the imagery above that. This nation under God. Notice above that the uh, great seal which includes the providential eye and a new it coeptus. He favors our undertakings. They're just going to pretty much have to bust this glass out and start over. No way to sanitize that, it seems to me, in order to please the ACLU and uh, the federal judiciary. How many times have you watched the uh, President of the United States deliver his State of the Union to both houses of Congress in this particular facility? You've seen the flag behind him when the camera people show you the president speaking. You've seen the two men, vice president, speaker of the house, sitting behind him, right? But the camera never tilts up about three feet. Probably deliberately. Because if they did so, you would see inscribed in marble, In God we trust. If you're going to take that off our money, you're going to have to carve it out of the house chamber as well. I wonder if this has had any impact on the men and women that sit in this august chamber day after day, year after year. Unbelievable. Let's move to some of our national monuments. You're familiar with this one? This one uh, commemorates, of course, one of the greatest presidents of our nation's history, Abraham Lincoln. In these monuments all over our capital, all sorts of inscriptions that will have to be effaced and eliminated. For example, here is Lincoln's second inaugural address engraved uh, on the walls. Look very closely. Here he was dealing with the Civil War. The Civil War was well underway. He makes this point. It's incredible. We got the North, we got the South. We got the Union soldiers, we got the Confederate soldiers. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. And each invokes his aid against the other. It may, stream, it may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged. Where'd that come from? Matthew chapter 7. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Here he is quoting scripture after scripture. Does he not understand that he's making a political speech, not preaching a sermon, and therefore it's inappropriate to make all these references to God in the Bible? Apparently he didn't understand that in 1864. He speaks of the providence of God. He speaks of how God, through his appointed time, if he now wills to remove this terrible scourge, he would do so, but it's up to him. Those divine attributes which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that the mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away, yet if God wills, that it continue till all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years. How long was slavery going on? Long before 1776. You can't pin that on the founders. Slavery began in the colonies under British rule. The founders tried to eliminate it and finally had to go to war. You move further down in this speech. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 99. You keep in count of these scripture references? These people knew their Bibles better than probably most people in the country today. Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago. Very short speech uttered to commemorate those who had died in this terrible Civil War conflict. And yet as you move down toward the uh, bottom of this speech, he says that this nation under God, that's pretty similar to what's on our coinage. So we're going to have to get rid of this too. You're going to have to dismantle the Lincoln Memorial, or at least go through and change all of the inscriptions. What about the Jefferson Memorial? I said last night, he, undoubtedly one of the least religious of the founders, and yet have you looked at what's in his memorial? God who gave us life 
What's that tell you about his belief in God? Creator. Gave us liberty. So God has bestowed upon the human race certain gifts. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? This man was not a deist, at least not according to the definition of deism today. Look what else he says. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. Not only did he believe in the God of the Bible, who, who dispenses gifts to the human race, but who, who possesses certain attributes, one of which is justice. I would say that Thomas Jefferson had a far greater developed understanding of God than many people claim he had. That his justice cannot sleep forever. What's he implying there? That a just God will eventually take action against human beings. <laughs> All of this is exactly what the Bible teaches. Declaration of Independence inscribed in the Jefferson Memorial. How many references to God in this document? Four. Going to have to get that out of there as well. Another Jefferson Memorial wall quotation. Almighty God hath created the mind free. All attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burthens are a departure, look at this, from the plan of the holy author of our religion. Two questions. What author are you talking about and what religion are you talking about? Any doubt? Look what he says toward the bottom. I know but one code of morality for men. Really? <laughs> well, you are crazy, Thomas, because there are many different religions, many different codes of morality. You shouldn't be trying to shove or, or legislate your morality down someone else's throat. Everybody ought to be free to believe whatever they want. Thomas Jefferson, if he were standing here today, I have no doubt, would say, you're wacko. There is one code of morality for the entire human race. Homosexuality is wrong everywhere, regardless of which civilizations approve of it. That was the beliefs of this man. What about the Washington Memorial? You know, when our first uh, president died, here was a man who has been given the universal title, Father of Our Country. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? Congress immediately said, we have got to do something to memorialize this great contributor to this great country. And so they set about trying to produce a suitable memorial. Well, you know how Congress works. It, it took a while, kind of fell by the wayside. Finally, they tried to revive the project, and so in 1833, they appointed the Washington National Monument Society, who got busy trying to collect funds, by the way, from Americans, from the rank and file of the public. And they worked on that. There were cities, there were states, there were civic and religious organizations that would contribute uh, stones that could be used in the construction of this thing. Took them quite a while, but they finally completed it in 1884. Took them a long time to get it done. There's no way for you and I to scale this monument to its very tip on the outside, the apex. But if you could do so, you would find there a 100 ounce aluminum capstone, largest casting of aluminum up to that point in time, that graces the very peak of this incredible monument. If you could look at the four sides of this apex, on three of the sides you would find engravings that you would expect to find. Dignitaries, dates, those who were involved in its construction, and so forth. But on one of the sides, the east face of the capstone facing into the heavens. Two lone Latin words. Laus Deo. Laud God. More idiomatically, praise be to God. I suppose the ACLU will get some repelling equipment and work their way up and get that off of there as well. That's not all. 
Many articles deposited in, in the recess of the cornerstone of this monument in 1884. Man, if historians could converge on this location and unseal this um, recess and look at what was in there, it is absolutely incredible. For example, there are newspapers from all over the country and the qualification for getting your newspaper put into this location was if there was an article in the newspaper regarding Washington. And so from all over the country representing many newspapers in many states, there are copies, 71 in fact, newspapers that are situated in this monument. That's not all. There are articles deposited here that uh, again would just be treasures to a historian. Copy of the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, Portrait of Washington from Stewart's painting, all sorts of things that in and of themselves would be valuable, uh, extremely um, coveted possessions. A Census of the United States, 1840, a copy of Drake's poems, um, bylaws of the Powhatan tribe, so there's some Native American artifacts, um, copy of the Constitution of the first uh, organized temperance society of America. I've looked through this entire list and they all you know have to do with things pertaining to the country but there are no items that you would designate as specifically and particularly religious except one the Bible there's no Quran there there's no um, Hindu Vedas uh, Charles Darwin's books not there origin of the species although it was in print by this time. The Bible. In addition, we have a number of uh, memorial stones. If instead of taking the elevator, you take the stairway all the way up, you will see stones that form the construction of this massive monument. And I'm telling you, these stones are loaded with our religious heritage. Proverbs 10.7 on this particular uh, stone placed or, or donated in 1865. Here is um, a stone that was donated by the Sunday school children of the Methodist Church. A preached gospel and a free press. Washington, we revere his memory. There's a, a book in the center that says, Search the Scriptures, and it has two passages, Luke 18, 16 and Proverbs 10, 7, donated in 1853. Here is a stone that was donated by the state of Pennsylvania, God and our native land. Here's one donated by the state of Kentucky. Notice how God and country are inextricably linked together under the auspices of heaven and the precepts of Washington. Here's one donated by the city of Baltimore, 1850. The inscription to the left says, May heaven to this union continue its beneficence. Do you see the theme, the motif that has continued throughout American history until about 50 years ago that people owe their national existence to the God of the Bible. And this comes out over and over and over again. Here is a stone donated by a temperance society. In fact, a number of the stones are donated by various temperance societies. People don't even know what that is today. But at the beginning of our nation, there were many temperance societies whose entire existence was dedicated to trying to get Americans not to consume alcohol. Young people would be amazed at that. This one says, the surest safeguard of the liberty of our country, the liberty of our nation, depends heavily on whether or not its people are abstinent with regard to intoxicants. Isn't that something? Christian orientation, very evident. Look at some of these national monuments and national architecture. I've showed you just some. There's much, much more. They're going to have to go through the nation's capital systematically and do a lot of changing if they want to try to rid the church from the state. Absolutely ridiculous. You're aware of the fact that every president that is sworn in to office takes an oath of office. Are you aware of the fact that um, this oath is found in the Constitution. It is stipulated in the Constitution. And you, of course, have heard this if you've observed any of the presidents. 
I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, defend the Constitution of the United States. Anything missing there? Don't most presidents say, so help me God? Yes, they do. It's not actually in the Constitution. So when and where and who started this particular uh, custom? <laughs> the first one, George Washington. He took it upon himself to add the words, so help me God. Every single president since that time has followed his example. You know what else George Washington did? Immediately after taking the oath of office on the Bible, he leaned down and kissed the Bible. That practice was followed until 1853 when Benjamin Pierce broke with that precedent. Do you know what Dwight D. Eisenhower did? 1954, when was it he was elected president after the... Uh, World War II, he was the supreme Allied commander, wasn't he, during World War II. All Allied forces. When he was elected president, took the oath of office, the first thing he did as he commenced his inaugural address was to ask the entire nation to bow their heads and he led the nation in prayer. Talk about politically incorrect. How many people did he offend when he did that? Folks, do you think that when this country started, there were no atheists, there were no Buddhists, there were no Muslims? Do you know what history records? There were. There weren't a lot. <laughs> but all of these groups and ideologies existed. And yet, the massive evidence shows, fine, you can live in this country, free country. We're not going to persecute you. We know what that's like. But your ideas, your religion, your atheism, it's not going to be given the time of day. It's not going to be allowed any sort of public indication. It's not going to be taught in the public schools. That was their attitude. Yes, you can come to this country because we're Christian, we're civil, we're not going to mistreat you. But don't think that our institutions are going to make allowance for the propagation and encouragement of your ideologies. They did not believe in pluralism as it's defined today. Look at this valuable document. Five different presidents signed this. It has the added statement, so help me God. Let's move on. Public school education. You won't believe this. You will not believe this. The first book in the American classroom was the Bible. I mean, it was used to teach children not only the meaning and the content of that book, but it, it was used to teach them how to read, to teach them uh, how to memorize, teach them how to stand up and recite. And it was used to teach them how to write. Penmanship. This is very common, very well documented. The first American public school textbook was the New England Primer. A primer is basically the first book to which a child is exposed for the purpose basically of teaching them grammar and how to read. Let me show you the New England Primer. I have a later copy, 1805 here. It goes back to the 1600s in this country. Used for about 200 years up until the late 1800s. There's the first page, cover. Second page, a divine song of praise to God for a child. How glorious is our heavenly king who reigns above the sky. Second page, public school textbook. And I'm telling you that's just the beginning. <laughs> How would you like to teach your children the alphabet using the Bible? After a series of... Uh, listing of uh, words based upon uh, length, number of syllables. We have, the, uh, we have Augur's Prayer taken directly from Proverbs chapter 30. Underneath that we have the uh, duty of children toward their parents. Tell me if you think this ought to be taught in the public school today. God hath commanded saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father and mother let him die the death. Matthew 15, 4. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1. 
You think that ought to be taught American public school children? Now look at the alphabet. A, in Adam's fall we send all. Calvinism there, but teaching children A from the word Adam. B, thy life to mend, this book attend. Look at D, the dog will bite a thief at night. Ooh, teaching morality, teaching children you shouldn't be stealing. Oh, that's one of the Ten Commandments. We can't teach them that. F, the idle fool is whipped at school. Oh, that's really politically incorrect. We can't do that at all. That's child abuse. Job feels the rod, yet blesses God. Peter denies his Lord and cries. Queen Esther comes in royal state to save the Jews from dismal fate. You know what? I wish they would strip the public school of all the teaching that's currently being done on teaching the alphabet and instigate this. It would teach them the letters. It would do it in a rhythmic, rhyming, very memorable sort of way. And it would teach them valuable lessons for life. How could you get any better than that? Rachel doth mourn for her firstborn. Samuel anoints whom God appoints. Uriah's beauteous wife may David seek his life. W, whales in the sea, God's voice obey. Youth forward slips, death soonest nips. Zacchaeus he did climb the tree, his Lord to see. And look at this dutiful child's promise. I will fear God, honor the king. See this predated in its origin the beginning of our country, I will honor my father and mother and obey superiors. Does that need to be taught to young people today? Moral precepts for children. Speak the truth and lie not. Look at that. Teaching them Bible and moral principles in the public school. Lord's Prayer at the bottom of this page. Page 18, a creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Just teaching a Bible. A cradle hymn by Dr. Watts, a number of references, not simply to generic religion, but to Jesus Christ. Here's a reference to the Jews and their role in the crucifixion of Christ. Now that's really politically incorrect. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. That goes back at least that far to the 1700s. Good children must fear God all day. Parents obey. No false things say, by no sin stray. Love Christ alway, in secret pray. Mind little play. There's a value, a cultural value norm that has evaporated. To teach children, you don't need to be spend a lot of time with foolishness, video game playing all the time. You need to be a productive human being. Don't be involved in a lot of frivolous playing. Is that taught today? Make no delay in doing good. This is great stuff. Substance, rich, deep, powerful. Then we come down, uh, we have a, a section that says some short and easy Questions. Listen to this. Tell me if you want this taught in the public school. Question, who made you? Answer, God. Who redeemed you? Answer, Jesus Christ. Who sanctifies and preserves you? Answer, the Holy Ghost. Of what were you made? Dust. What does that teach you? To be humble and mindful of death. What end were you made? To serve God. And how are you to serve Him? In spirit and in truth public classroom. Here's a section with a conversation between the devil, Christ, a youth, and at the very end, death. Teaching children what life's about. How Satan's always trying to uh, lure people. Here's a lengthy section, questions and answers, out of the Holy Scriptures. Who was the first man? Adam. Who was the first woman? Eve. On and on and on. Folks, there's more Bible in this public school textbook than much of the Bible curriculum material used in Sunday Bible classes on Sunday morning all over the country. Taught in the public school system. It ends with a short prayer to be used every morning and a short prayer to be used every evening. Prayer in a public school textbook in the public school system. Written into the textbook. Unbelievable. Our days begin with trouble here. Our life is but a span. This is page 72, last page. And cruel death is always near, so frail a thing is man. Then sow the seeds of grace while young. 
that when you come to die, thou mayest sing that triumphant song, Death, where's thy victory? Anybody recognize that? 1 Corinthians 15. How many of you ever heard of the McGuffey readers? Mr. McGuffey was, so far as I can tell, an amazing man. Lived from 1800 to 1873. This was the standardized reading textbook for most American public schools during the 1800s. First published in 1836, there were six levels. It wasn't based on first grade, second grade, third grade. There were just six levels. You get through the first one, you move to the second. That's how American public schools were set up. Loaded with religious messages, he sought to instill morality in children. Over 120 million sold from 1836 to 1890. America's population, much less than that. Practically every American uh, child, every American that went through public school during this period was exposed to this book. Let me give you some samples. Here's the second reader. Here's the table of contents. Praise to God, about doing good at play, how the world was made, the honest boy and the thief, the Lord's Prayer, the disobedient girl, emulation without envy, story about Joseph, the Ten Commandments, about using profane language. In the revised edition, pretty is that pretty does. You ever heard that? God is great and good. Moving to the third reader, the goodness of God, touch not, taste not, handle not. What's that? Colossians 3, the importance of well-spent youth, gospel invitation, ode from the 19th Psalm, consultation of religion to the poor, on prayer, on and on this goes. Here's a section that talks about capitalizing any references to Christ or God. You can be sure and capitalize those. Uh, the fourth reader, the golden rule, the sermon on the mount, King Solomon and the ants. This just goes on and on. Look at... Uh, Page 255, a mother's gift. You know what that mother's gift is? I've given it to you on the opposite page. A mother's gift is the Bible. My mother gave me my Bible is the thrust of that section of the book. Divine providence, scripture lesson, Satan and death at the gates of hell, thoughts in the place of a public worship, the gods of the heathen. Heathen? The Proverbs of Solomon. Fifth reader, do not meddle, work, respect for the Sabbath rewarded. Select paragraphs from the Bible. The Bible, the best of classics. My mother's Bible. There's the section on that. The Bible, the best of classics. Lengthy section talking about it. Sixth reader. The New England pastor. Death of Absalom. Immortality of the soul. In the publisher's preface to one of these, uh, one of these uh, educational authorities of the time talked about what Mr. McGuffey was trying to do in these. How would McGuffey's... Uh, how would McGuffey teach reading if he were here today? First, he would be concerned about the content of pupils' reading. The content would promote moral growth and excellence of mind in habits, attitudes, and literary tastes. And morality in McGuffey's thinking was closely aligned with the Christian religion. No other foundation could produce true morality. Upon this basis, he collected and wrote the selections for his famous readers. Christian orientation in the public school textbooks of this nation. How many of you recognize this? This was loaned to me by a lady in Waco, Texas. She had actually used it. I suspect she was in her 80s. This is called the Blue Back Speller. These three textbooks formed the basic thrust of American public school up until 1950 or 60. This too is loaded. Noah Webster was actually the author of the Blue Back Speller. I, this copy is from the 1857 edition. The Holy Bible is the book of God. Strong drink will debase a man. Many references to the evils of alcohol in this particular passage. Good men obey the laws of God. God created the heavens and the earth. We go to church on the first day of the week. God will bless those who do his will. Beggars will beg rather than work. A judge must not be a bad man. Amen to that. Good boys will use their books with care. God makes the ground bring forth fruit. The preacher is to preach the gospel. You drink rum, you're going to come to ruin. On and on this goes. The idle boy is a very lazy fellow. Many times there are specific references or spe uh, specific quotations of uh, passages uh, from Scripture. We punish bad men to prevent crimes. In our next session together, I want to show you a little bit more from this because... Again, it could almost be used 
as Bible school curriculum material. Folks, we live in an incredibly different era so far as our public school education is concerned.